Good morning. Let me invite you as we come for worship this morning to take the next few moments and prepare your hearts and minds uh, for praising God and for being challenged uh, by God's Spirit. Let's, uh, let's worship together. Thanks, Gregory. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship today. Welcome to this time that we set aside during uh, each week to gather as the entire community of the First Presbyterian Church of San Luis Obispo and to offer our praises, to listen for God's word read and proclaimed, uh, to share in prayer, uh, to sing beautiful music, and sometimes just to sit in silence. Uh, but we are here, we are together, uh, this is an opportunity for us to, uh, to present our lives before God as a living sacrifice because of what God has done for us first. Welcome to those of you who are watching on the live stream and on the recording. We are glad that we can all be together this way. Uh, lots of things going on both in the world and in our church. Um, for the world, uh, I'm sure you've been watching the news, we continue to watch. Uh, what has happened uh, through natural disaster in our own country and through very human-made disasters in other countries. And so uh, we come here, as I say very often, not to escape, but to, uh, but to be shaped into the disciples who can uh, address and help and pray and serve uh, for people who are in need in other places. Lots, of, lots happening here at the congregate, here at the church today. Uh, today, there's a luncheon after church. I'll mention it a couple of times today, not because I'm hungry, 
but because it's important. This is an opportunity later on for us to fellowship together, to share in a tasty meal from Mama's Meatballs down the street, uh, and also to talk a bit about stewardship for the coming year. Uh, that's gonna be our theme uh, as we move through these next six or seven weeks. Uh, so brace yourself. We're gonna talk a little bit about money and ministry over these next uh, couple of months. Uh, no reservations needed for the lunch. We got plenty of food. If you didn't register, if you, if you thought you were gonna squirm out of it by not RSVPing, I'm relieving you of that burden. Uh, but come and share and have a good meal, and uh, I promise I, I won't talk for very long uh, while we do that. We'll look at a couple of pretty slides, and then we'll be done. Uh, as we worship today, let us say together the opening prayer that you'll find up on the screen. Let's pray these words together. O oh God, you have made heaven and earth and all that is good, and in Jesus Christ you show us that the secret of joy is a heart set free from selfish desires. Help us to delight in simple things and to rejoice always in the richness of your bounty. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. That God we pray to is worthy of praise. Let's stand together and sing some praises to God.
I'm Susan Updegrove, and I'll be your liturgist this morning. <clears throat> it is good for us to ask for God's forgiveness when we gather for worship. Please pray with me, then take a moment for your own silent prayer of confession. Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us amend what we are and direct what we shall be so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. 
Now please offer your own silent prayers of confession. May the God of mercy, who forgives you all your sins, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Let's take a moment with that good news still ringing around here. Uh, Stay in your general vicinity, but... uh... I don't know why that gets a laugh every week. I know it's because you're planning already on going to another part of the sanctuary. Stand up if you are able and pass the peace of Christ. As you find your seats, I will remind you that uh, there's an opportunity after church today to gather for lunch and to continue the conversations you just started. Uh, Hopefully you want to continue the conversations you just started. Uh, And lots of announcements today and also a little introduction to something new in the season. So uh, lots going on in the life of the church. Uh, The details are in the bulletin on the insert. Uh, the, uh, today, this afternoon, after the luncheon at 4 o'clock, we'll have our uh, Jazz Vespers concert here. Uh, so that looks, to be, uh, that looks to be excellent, so come and uh, participate in that. Uh, the rest of the, uh, the announcements, they're in the insert. And the reason I'm doing that is because we have another longer announcement that I need to make. Uh, this is the season. I always say tis the season, uh, but it's not that season. This is stewardship season, and unlike a lot of my colleagues, my brothers and sisters in ministry, I love talking about money. I get to say that here up front uh, once a year, every year, and today is the day. Uh, Over the next few weeks, and if you've been part of church life for any amount of time, you know that this is something that happens in uh, in the autumn season. We're gonna talk about giving. And uh, not just money, but certainly money, time and talent and your prayers, all the things that go into making a church successful. And by successful, I don't mean just in the black, and I don't just mean, you know, with a certain number of people. I mean doing meaningful ministry amongst ourselves and in the community and around the world. That's what makes this church. That's how we define success at this church. And so uh, lots of things will happen. Up here, we'll, we'll hear from different ministries uh, over the next uh, month or so, maybe a little bit more. And then on uh, Christ the King Sunday, which I believe is November 24th, we'll pray over the pledges that are here. And then your session will go to work to create a budget for 2025. So this is all sort of integrated into church life. The ministry that we do here, like almost everything else that we do, requires bills to be paid. And that's a a little bit about what we talk about uh, during this stewardship season. What you won't hear from me or from others who get up here and speak is the word need. This is not a, oh, we have this hole to fill, can you fill it with your money? This is an opportunity for us to talk about partnership and the kind of church that we want and the kind of church that we are willing to make successful by those other measures through our giving of time and talent and treasure, which is fancy church talk for money. Okay? Trying to be as clear as possible as we do this. 
We're going to hear a little bit more at lunch, but even that is not going to be, you know, sort of granular detail about budgets. That's for January when we present the budget to you at the congregational meeting. Um, today, uh, as we talk about different ministries, it's my job to remind you that your giving helps with the utilities and with taking care of the building and with paying our basic bills here. And we've got a little lighthearted video that we're gonna show and uh, the lights will come down and you'll, you'll see this video. We just wanna show you what will happen or what might happen if we don't support paying the utility bills. Okay, so now I feel like it's my responsibility to say no children were harmed in the making of these videos. <laughs> That's a lighthearted way to remind all of us that our giving supports the basic costs of what it means to keep a building open. Uh, the light, the heat, the water, all of those kinds of things. Over the next few uh, weeks, you'll hear uh, what might be more interesting ministries, but not more important. Our space is important to us, and your giving makes that space possible. So over these next few months, you'll hear from other ministries. Uh, at the lunch today, you'll hear some other things. You're going to have multiple opportunities to get a pledge form in your hand. That is my goal, that uh, uh, seven is our baseline. You're going to have seven chances to have a pledge form in your hand. And that's because all of us are busy. I, I will tell you, I was busy recuperating from surgery last January and December, and I forgot to turn in a pledge form. Now, I had a good excuse, but uh, I just want you to know, we're going to put it in your hands a lot uh, so that there's an opportunity to remember to do it. Let me encourage you over this season uh, to pray about this church, to pray about uh, your desire for partnership, uh, to pray for those poor kids who need light and heat and water as they do their little Bible studies here at the church. Let's pray together. Let's pray for our stewardship season, and then we'll go into the Lord's Prayer. Let's pray together. Loving God, we are so grateful for the ministry that you have given us to share, for the partnership that you invite us into, for the life of discipleship that you call us to live each and every day of our lives. We thank you for this church, for its facilities. We thank you for the, the people who volunteer here and work here. We thank you for the ways that in uh, multiple small ways and in many big ways, we are a reflection of the love and grace and sacrifice of your son. We pray during this season that you would touch all of our hearts, that you would uh, uh, help us be uh, committed and generous givers and partners in this ministry that we do together, and that you would continue to grow this church for the next century and a half. We pray all of these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, the one who taught all of his disciples to pray these words, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Jen's got a message for us now. I have a question. 
What is giving and why do we do it? Well, to answer that question, we give because it shows our love for God and our love for others. We give because God asks us to. We give because God has given so much to us that in gratitude, we give back. How do we give, you may ask? Well, we give however we can and in whatever way we can. We can give money, but we can also give our time, our talent, our gifts, our skills, and even things sometimes. Each person has their own reasons for giving what they can. We are starting our stewardship season here at First Pres. So here's another question. What is stewardship? Well, stewardship is all forms of giving and all types of gifts. Time, talent, skills, and money. God has asked us to be responsible and care for what has been entrusted to us by God. Entrusted means that we'll take good care of it. One way we can do that is by giving. And you know what? I'm glad I'm part of a church that needs money because you know what that means? It means that we love God, we love people, and we love to do things about that. Let us pray. Dear God, thank you for blessing us with all kinds of ways to give. Every little bit helps in whatever way we can give. In your name we pray, amen. And just so you know, here's my giving box. So every time I have a little extra, I go ahead and put it right in there, and then I can share it. Bye! That was scary. We'll continue to pray for her, and also uh, we'll give you an update as we hear it on, uh, on how she's doing. I feel like saying, where were we? But uh, the choir, I think, is done for the day. <laughs> uh, and you're on. I'm going to bring our liturgist back. <laughs> Let's all take a deep breath. It is good for us to ask for God's forgiveness when we gather for worship. I already did that part. <laughs> I kept trading my sheet. Where are we? No. Join me as we affirm what we believe by saying this selection from the Confession of Belhar. We believe, we believe that, that God, God has entrusted, entrusted the church with a message of reconciliation in and through Jesus Christ. We believe that the church is called to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. That the church is, is called to us because it is a pace, pacemaker. That the church is witness both by word and by deed to the new heaven and the new earth in which righteousness dwells. We believe that God's life-giving word and spirit has conquered the powers of sin and death, and therefore also if irreconciliation and hatred, bitterness, and enmity. We believe that God's life-giving word and spirit will enable the church to live in a new obedience which can open new possibilities of life for society and the world. Please. For life, for society and the world. Please listen as I read today's scripture from Genesis 
15, 1 through 6. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless and the, and the one who will inherit my estate is Ellen Azer of Damascus? And Abram said, You have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him, This man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. He took him outside and said, Look at the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. Abram believed the Lord, and he credited it to him as righteousness. The word of the Lord. When I picked that passage, it's because it ties to the heir and inheritance language in our text this morning, but I'm struck by the first line that God's our protector. We lift up Linda and uh, ask for God to be her protector right now, trusting that God has promised that he would be. Another deep breath. Yeah. Let's pray together. God, thank you for your words. Thank you for the ways that they point to the one who is your word, Jesus Christ. And we ask that you bless our listening together as we listen for what you would have us do through your words. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. Some of you may not know, but I, I have a, a sort of a, a long and checkered history in my working life, and I spent 15 years of it as a professional fundraiser. Now, that wasn't supposed to land on Stewardship Sunday, I promise. This this text was chosen long before we chose this day. But uh, one of my specialties was to work in the area of what they call planned giving. Now, those of you who've had contact with development officers or know uh, a little bit about development shops at charities and schools around the country, uh, you know that planned giving is where you help people establish estate planning, uh, including charitable giving. And so I worked with people all over the country in setting up uh, estate plans so that they could give and leave something uh, to the charities and to the schools that they really cared about. I, I spent six years with Union Rescue Mission, which is a large homeless mission in downtown Los Angeles, and another four with Fuller Seminary, where I had uh, been a graduate, and then another couple of years working for the Presbyterian denomination in their, uh, in their foundation. And so this work is near and dear to me because I watched as people were able to take uh, a look, a, an, an honest, candid look at what they had accumulated over their lifetime and how they had uh, applied some of that uh, to, to provide continuing support for organizations and churches that they cared for. So that's not a hint. I, I mean, I promise we are going to talk about wills and estates at some point here, but this just ties with the text that we're reading today. A will, and the technical term for a will, is a last will and testament. A will is a way to ensure that what you have goes to the people that you choose. It's a way of organizing your stuff and distributing it after you're gone. In our training, we were always told stories of arguments within families, right, about uh, who got what and how disappointed heirs could be to find that the bulk of grandma or grandpa's or mom's or dad's fortune went to uh, a charitable organization or a church and not to them. It's always a dramatic scene in a movie or a television show. Uh, the family gathers in some fancy office and they're all eyeing each other and sizing each other up. Each of them already has plans for what they think they're going to get. If you haven't seen the movie Knives Out, thank you. Uh, 
And then usually, in the movies anyway, there's some surprise. Someone gets something that they didn't expect, which means that someone else didn't get something that they may have been counting on. And that's usually where the movie or the show or the play takes off as family members scheme against each other to get what's theirs. After all of that setup, that's not what we're talking about today. No argument here. We're, today's, today's text will point to an inheritance that is freely given and that will never run out, and when one person gets it, it does not mean that someone else does not receive the same. Sometimes we all talk, though, about things that we've inherited or things maybe that we hope to inherit. Sometimes we're really talking about genetics. I have my mother's face, but I have my dad's body. That's genetics. There's nothing I can do about that one. Luckily, my mom's really nice looking. <laughs> that is not written here, just so you know. Other times we're talking about things that we've inherited because our parents have, or, or people who were caring for us have passed on some trait that is meaningful to them. They've imparted something about themselves. I have my dad's love of history. He taught history for 40 years, both at school and in the home. <laughs> but I have my mom's outlook on life, which is very different from my father's. And so those are things that aren't so much genetic, but things that they took the time to share and model for me. Other things might find their way into a last will and testament. Uh, I know that there are some very sentimental things coming from uh, both of my parents uh, in their estate plans. All of that points us a little bit towards our text this morning. We're spending a few months in the eighth chapter of Paul's letter to the Romans. It's an important letter. It's an important city that he's writing to, as we've seen. It's a part of Paul's mission to nurture this church at the heart of the Roman Empire so that the rest of the world will hear the gospel through them, which, as a historian, we know happens and, uh, and has happened. Last week, we talked about the things that drive us. In Paul's language, it was a battle between flesh and spirit, and for us, it's really this. In our own lives, are we going to focus only on what we want, or are we going to make decisions and in, that include the needs and the hopes of other people? Oddly enough, you can hear a little bit of love God and love your neighbor in that. Our text this morning is from Romans 8, verses 12 to 17, and we're going to focus on verse 17. Listen for God's word this morning. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die, but if by the Spirit you, but by the spirit you put together, pardon me, but if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves, so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship, and by Him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. God's word for us this morning. It's a great passage. It's got a lot in it. It's got a lot we're not going to talk about this morning because it's so rich. But just looking at some of the verses in our passage, Remember that last week, the, the whole idea was that battle between flesh and spirit. And so he's continuing that part of the conversation here. The spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship or daughtership. Let's not be too exclusive here. 
And then we see this great passage, this great verse where he talks about, uh, then we get to approach God not as someone we, we, we bow and scrape and, and fear, but someone we get to call Abba Father. Abba is daddy in Aramaic. It is a term of affection and endearment. It is a way of saying, I am completely safe and comfortable in your presence. It's a way of, uh, of conveying intimacy and fun and connection, all in one word. You notice it's the word that Jesus says from the cross. Abba, Abba. Lama, Lama Sabachthani. My God, my God, my dad, my dad. And so... It's a term of endearment, it's a term of connection, and it's a, it's a way that we now get to approach God himself. And then he goes on to say, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we're God's children, and then if we are children, then we're heirs. Heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings, that we may also share in his glory. All of this business about being heirs and co-heirs and inheritances, all of that is really important to what Paul's trying to teach in this passage. And it matched up with the way the Romans understood the world. It matched up with the way the Romans saw their own emperors, the highest human being that they could imagine. Julius Caesar adopted a boy named Octavian, and he changed his name to Augustus, and he's the one who took over for Julius Caesar as emperor. And after him, this is the history part, Tiberius, Caligula, Claudius, and Nero, those were all the next emperors. None of them were related father, father to son, biologically. They were all adopted and groomed and then placed in power by their fathers. They were heirs called on to carry on their father's business. That was their inheritance. We know all this because it was clearly stated in each of their wills. Wills were serious business in first century Rome in a, in a place where so much wealth could be accumulated so quickly, estate planning was very, very important. Wills were the only ways, then and now, to control what happens in one's estate after death. Wills in first century Rome had three characteristics. They were public, they were signed in public, and they were accessible to people uh, in public. Uh, they were guarded by law. The full force of the Roman military and whatever passed for law enforcement in those days uh, backed up the power of a will. And then they were also, the third thing, they were also, they were written in set forms of language. Trying to defraud a will was punished with Roman severity. And so here's an example. This one is, dates from the early second century. I'm not going to read it all because, as you can, you can see, it's quite long. And there's a lot of names in there that I can't pronounce. But it starts with the eighth year of the Emperor Augustus uh, at Tebtunis in the division of Polemon in the Arsenal name. So what I'm going to summarize here is how specific this will is. This will names a person as having a scar on the right arm. That's the way you can identify them. And that person can be vouched for by this other man who has a scar just on his forehead, just over his right brow. All of these things are given to the right people, and uh, the rules are there for how to identify those people. It is very specific to the point of being pedantic. It's just over and over and over again. But yet, every single person named in there is given a very specific thing in that will. That idea of inheritance and what people get is important in the Bible, too. One writer said, the idea of inheritance in the Bible is a reminder that God has not intended people to lead an autonomous, isolated, or self-sufficient existence. 
Wills were meant to connect people across generations. Not just about who gets what, but about this is my inheritance from my father or my grandmother. This is the thing that connects me to them that I now can share with my children or the people who are special to me. That writer went on to say that in the Bible, in God's view, an inheritance describes something received from the past, but that looks forward to a future. Our inheritance as Christians is rooted in the fulfilled promises of the past. And we see those promises fulfilled in Jesus. And we have a renewed hope in the sense that more promises will be fulfilled in the future. Not bad, right? God was good in the past. We can trust that God will be good in the future. Reading these texts together is a reminder that God loves us and that God has set aside an inheritance for us. But what exactly is that inheritance? It's easy to think, and I think this is what the church has done for a very long time, it's easy to think that our inheritance from God is something far away in the future, that it's something about leaving the earth and going to heaven when we die. But that misses a key point that Paul is trying to make and that God is trying to make. It's the same point that Jesus was teaching when he talked about the kingdom in the Lord's Prayer, on earth as it is in heaven. It's not just about the future. It's also about the present. The kingdom of God, which is our inheritance, is now and not yet. It's part present and it's part future. It's about how we live now when we live by the Spirit instead of the flesh, as we saw last week, when we live according to the values of the kingdom instead of our own desires and wants. And so what does that mean for us? What is Paul trying to tell the Roman Christians, and what is Paul trying to teach us? Three things. These are the things for us to hold on to today. First, by committing ourselves to following Jesus and remembering that we're, uh, and first, by committing ourselves to Jesus, that makes us remember that we're not committing ourselves to another form of slavery. It's not trading one bondage for another. It's not trading one flesh for another. Even in the text, Paul says, the spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. The second thing is that choosing a life of faith and trusting that God is who he says he is, choosing faith means being adopted into God's family. We don't talk a lot about adoption, which is too bad. I, it, it has been a, a wonderful way for families to grow and to expand, for love to be shared, for protection and shelter and nurture to be extended to people who for some in some circumstances, that was denied them, or uh, they, were, they lived under the threat of that being denied to them. Adoption ends up being a theme in the New Testament because we are adopted into God's family. We might not be blood-related to God, but God makes us part of his family. Every bit as much as those Roman emperors chose somebody and made them part of their family. This passage is perfect for us as we start our stewardship season. And all this talk, talk about uh, giving and expenses and uh, revenues and investing and all the things that we talk about, the real question we're asking ourselves during this season is this. What kind of church do we want to leave for the next generation? What are we willing to leave for the people who worship and serve here for the next 150 years. Now, if we are children, Paul says, we are, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. Maybe the real theme for this stewardship season should sound like this. As co-heirs with Christ, 
let's share a little bit of that glory. That's my hope for us. That's what we'll talk about later on at the luncheon. That's what we'll talk about here over the next couple of months. It is our opportunity to share in the glory that God bestows upon his church, the body of Christ. That is our inheritance. And now the question is, what are we leaving for whoever comes next? Let's pray together. God, we thank you that you have given us this inheritance, that you've given us this life to share now, this life that you have given us uh, to make a part of our own existence and history and family and work. God, we pray as we move ahead that you would continue to grow in us a sense that this blessing is meant to be shared with each other and with your world. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. That seems like a good lead in to now's the time where we're going to share our tithes and pledges and morning offerings. pray together. God, you have loved us so lavishly, and we are here in gratitude for the ways that you have loved us. We ask that you take these gifts and use them to share that love here in this church and in this community and around the world. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. While you're still standing, let's, uh, let's close our service and being mindful of Linda and uh, hoping that she's okay. I have not heard anything yet. Um, as
before we go over to the uh, luncheon, uh, let's sing together, Christ has made the sure foundation. Just a reminder that we have lunch across the way. That's a time of fellowship and also a little bit of learning about the beginnings of our stewardship season. Uh, for now, let's say together our charge and blessing. Friends, what is our mission? Our mission is to glorify Jesus Christ and to be instruments of God's healing, reconciling, life-giving presence in the world. And so hear this benediction. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with each and every one of us each and every day. Amen. Go in peace.